have the homework problems in front of you? Yes, yes. Okay, well, let's take a look at those. Okay, uh, let's see. So I, uh, I just looked at uh, some of your answers here in the first few minutes. So it looks like you got the correct slogan for question one. So question one is correct. Uh, I looked at your answer for number two, and that looks correct as well. Remember, the thing that was giving us trouble with this before was getting the right pattern on the main chain. Nitrogen, alpha carbon, carboxy carbon. Nitrogen, alpha carbon, carboxy carbon. And then especially down here, nitrogen, alpha carbon, carboxy carbon. Here, the nitrogen is on the right because we made a U-turn. Uh, but it looks like this time you did that correctly. So that's good. Uh, uh, actually, it looks like you actually drew two hydrogen bonds. So that's good. Uh, you drew two hydrogen bonds here. Excellent. Uh, very good. Uh, can you see this on the screen? Yes, yes. What's the name of this amino acid? That is... That is um, 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 that is leucine. No, no, that's not the same. It's missing one more carbon. carbon. That is... Um, um, valine. Right. Valine with the V. It's just a V connected to the main chain. Okay, good. What's the name of this amino acid? That is... Uh, that is tyrosine. Tyrosine. Excellent. And this one? That one is, uh, that one is serine. Very good. Okay, good. I haven't reviewed those with you, but again, uh, you got the test coming up in a couple of days, and it's pretty sure to be important to have those uh, amino acids all memorized, so I hope that you're reviewing those on your own. Well, let's look at question, <clears throat> excuse me, let's look at question five. Do you have question five in front of you? <clears throat> Yes. Okay. Now, I'm a little confused by your answer for question five, because for question five, your answer has a part A, a part B, and a part C, but actually question five only has parts A and B. So I'm not quite sure what you were meaning to answer here. So maybe let's kind of just do this problem again. Uh, you can just tell me now what would be your answer for 5A. For 5A. So take um, another look at 5A. What's the correct answer for that? Hydrogen bonds um, on the main chain. Okay, that's right. How about for uh, part B? For part B, it's main chain. What type of interaction? Hydrogen bonds between main chain. Okay, so it looks like there was some kind of confusion here. Uh, I guess you kind of added, I'm not sure what you were answering with this part A here. You kind of, uh, I'm not sure where that came in. But anyway, the, those answers that you just gave were correct. So what type of interaction stabilizes secondary structure? Hydrogen bond between the main chain. Atoms. Okay, good. That's right. Number six. So those are correct answers for A and for B and for C. Um, you might use, if this was a test question, you might use the term coiled coil for part C, since that's what the textbook calls it. Now, for part D, uh, I don't think we quite got the right answer. I, I, I tried to give you a hint in part D that we had to be careful with this answer, but it looks like you kind of gave a, a, pretty, uh, a pretty short answer that I don't think was quite correct. So let, let's talk about that uh, a little bit more. So what do I mean when I say alpha that the, the structure of alpha keratin has two levels? Well, my question was, uh, we're looking at 6D. Notice I, gave you, I tried to give you a hint for 6D that we have to keep in mind that the structure of alpha keratin has two different levels. What are the two different levels of the structure? The two different levels would be alpha helix and is it beta beta sheet or not? For alpha keratin? No. Um, Remember that, so take, take a look at question six, so you know what we're talking about. I'm looking yeah. at part 6D. Um, yes. 6D said that we are looking at the structure of alpha keratin and I gave you the hint that there's two different levels that have to be maintained. 
But what do I mean by that? What are the two different levels of the structure of alpha keratin? Um, one's held by weak interactions and others by disulfide links. Okay, that's not quite right, but that, that's still not quite what I was going for. I was going for what are the two levels? What are the, what, why, why would I say there's two levels of structure to alpha keratin? What is the structure of alpha keratin and why would we think of that alpha as two helix. levels? Please say again? Alpha helix. Two, um, al two alpha helix coiled together. All right. Do you see why I would say that's two different levels of structure? So the lower level is there's an alpha helix or there's alpha helixes. And then the higher level of structure is that there's the coiled coil. The alpha helixes coiled around each other. Okay. Each of those has to be maintained. What is it that stabilizes the structure of the alpha helix? Hydrogen bonds between the main chain atoms. And then going to the coiled coil, what is it that stabilizes the coiled coil? And I think, I think you might not remember the answer to that, so I'll just explain that. The coiled coil is stabilized by weak interactions. What are the weak interactions? Um, hydrogen bonds, van der Waals forces, and electromagnetic um, attraction. Say that last one again, please. Uh, is it electromagnetic interactions? Now, no, there's no magnetism involved here, so they're called electrostatic interactions uh, because they're between static charges. Uh, so to review, what are the three types of weak interactions? Electrostatic interactions, um, van der Waal forces, and hydrogen bonds. And the coiled coil is also sometimes stabilized... by disulfide links. We talked last time about how certain structures would tend to have more disulfide links than others. Perhaps some don't have any. Okay, so do you see what I mean when I say alpha keratin has two different levels of structure that have to be stabilized? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, it's easy to get confused between these. These are the two different levels. Two levels of the structure. This is the part that I think we were still getting kind of confused about. So uh, this is stabilized by weak interactions and sometimes uh, by disulfide links. Okay. Um, generally speaking, I would suppose these would be um, weak interactions and disulfide links between side chains. Weak interactions. Disulfide links are always, by definition, between side chains. Second. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you see what I mean when I would say the coiled coil is a higher level of structure than alpha helix? Do you see what, what, what I mean by that? Yeah. Because first you kind of form the helix and then that's put into a higher level of structure. The general pattern here is secondary structure is stabilized by hydrogen bonds between main chain atoms. And higher levels are stabilized by weak interactions and disulfide links between side chains. 
So this is not just for alpha keratin, this is a general rule. Secondary structure, secondary structure is stabilized by hydrogen bonds between main chain atoms. Higher levels of structure are stabilized by weak interactions and disulfide links between side chains. So that's not just for alpha keratin, that's a general rule. Here's the stabilization for secondary structure. Here's the general rule that stabilizes higher levels of structure. Okay. Uh, ready to keep going? Yeah. All right. So if you look here, the answer you gave for 6, uh, well, you tell me. What's the answer to 6D? Um, what is the structure about? For the, um, the higher level of the structure of alpha keratin, it's weak interactions between side chains and sometimes disulfide links. And what is the higher level? The coil coil. Good. And um, for the secondary structure, it's the alpha helix, and that's stabilized by hydrogen bond between the main chain atoms. Okay, good. So these types of answers that I'm going for here, these are the types of answers that you would expect that you would want to give uh, on the exam for a short answer type question. So it looks like most of the questions are actually on your test going to be multiple choice, but you're also going to have uh, a few short answer type uh, problems, so those are the types of answers you might want to give. Okay, so number seven. One more thing that collagen is a component of that I think is important is teeth. So you might have added teeth to this list of things. Collagen has a triple helix. So a few more things we might want to describe about the structure of collagen. What can you tell me about the primary structure of collagen? What can you tell me about the primary structure of one strand? Um, the primary structure of one strand of collagen is that <clears throat> Every three, uh, every three peptide is um, glycine, and it requires um, hydro hydroxyl pro hydroxyl proline to stabilize it. To stabilize who? Hydroxy proline to stabilize the collagen. Okay, so that's on the right track. So first of all, every third amino acid is glycine. Why? Because glycine is small and it fits well. Where? In the interior of the structure. Yeah, th those are all things that we'd want to say if we had a short answer uh, type question. So only glycine can fit in the interior of the triple helix. Uh, and then for the rest of your answer, we should say that many of the remaining amino acids are either proline or hydroxyproline. Many of the remaining amino acids are either proline or hydroxyproline. Uh, so Hydroxyproline is important to stabilize the structure. That's true. There's also lots of prolines as well. Okay. This is the correct answer for number eight. It's one more thing I might, maybe I should have mentioned uh, for number eight. So, the silk protein is called silk fibroin. I didn't mention this term last time, but this might pop up on the test. So the silk protein is called silk fibroin. What's the key secondary structure in silk fibroin? Beta plus G. Yeah. So I just didn't use this term before, but that might pop up on the test. Okay. All right. So your answer for number nine is a good start, but if this was a short answer problem, I wouldn't give you full credit for this yet. So, um, because you didn't answer, why would a rigid structure tend to have more sulfurs? Why would a rigid structure tend to have more sulfurs? A rigid structure um, has, more stru has more sulfurs because sulfurs are <clears throat> Bonded via covalent bond, so that's a lot. That's the strong um, attraction. Okay, that's on the right track too. That's on the right track. I still don't think that would be quite full credit. We need to be a little bit clearer about that. So the key thing is, 
it's always good to lay out the logic step by step. Fingernails have many cysteine residues. That's one key term that you didn't use in the answer you were just giving. Fingernails have many cysteine residues, which allows them to have many disulfide links. And that makes them rigid. Well, I don't, you don't have to, this doesn't have to be included, but it's good to know disulfide links are strong covalent interactions. All right, um, I would suggest that when you're writing out answers, you might have noticed that I often kind of try to lay out the logic with these arrows like this. This would be a good way for you to lay out your answers as well, on tests as well. A good way to make sure you're really understanding every step in the logic is to lay it out step by step like this with arrows. So this would be a good way to answer the, the homework problems that I've been giving you, and it would also be a good way to, uh, you can use this notation as well uh, on uh, essay questions on the exam as well to let the TA see that you're, you're understanding each step of the logic. Uh, okay, so you were on the right track with number nine, but I think for full credit, you'd want to put in a little more for some more details, such as high sulfur content indicates lots of cysteines, which allow disulfide links. All right, do uh, you have that down? Yes, yes. Okay, your answer for number 10 is a good answer. This is a good answer for number 10. One little detail, you might want to say that beta pleated sheets are nearly fully stretched out. I don't think they're completely stretched out. There's some give in silk, right? If you, if you, if you pull on silk, it is somewhat uh, elastic. Um, so beta pleated sheets are usually nearly fully uh, stretched out. I don't know if the TA would be picky about that. Uh, but otherwise, that, that's, a, uh, that's a fairly good answer for, uh, for number 10, so that's good. Number 11, so let's look at the logic here. This is a type of question, again, that you might have wanted to use arrows for. Scurvy is caused by a lack of vitamin C. And then you explained a lack of vitamin C means inactive prolyl hydroxylase. And then you explain that's an enzyme, excellent. What does the enzyme prolyl hydroxylase do? It activates hydroxyproline. Okay. That's not quite right. That's not quite right. Um, I think you confuse two things. Vitamin C activates prolyl hydroxylase. I think you confuse those ideas. Vitamin C activates prolyl hydroxylase. What does prolyl hydroxylase do? Prolyl hydroxylase, <laughs> excuse me, prolyl hydroxylase makes hydroxyproline. Do you see the distinction? It doesn't activate the hydroxyproline. It makes the hydroxyproline. Let's go back to that logic again. So here's the two steps of the logic. You can tell me when you have that down.
Okay. Okay. Uh, again, it's it's oftentimes best to uh, to write things out. We want to write out these these thought steps as clearly as possible. So anyway, do you see how this is different from what you wrote down? You got the first step right. You said that vitamin C activates prolohydroxylase. Uh, but then you said the enzyme activates hydroxyproline. How is that incorrect? What, what does the enzyme actually do? It doesn't activate hydroxyproline. What does it do? Um... It activates proline, or it changes proline into hydroxyproline. Yeah, so it makes, it doesn't activate hydroxyproline, it makes hydroxyproline out of proline. Uh, okay, and if you have low hydroxyproline levels, that would be le mean uh, less stable collagen. Okay, now the fact is there's still some details here that we didn't get go into. I didn't go into every single detail about this uh, to save time, uh, but uh, it's important to get the details right that we, that we did talk about. So hopefully that'll be enough uh, for the exam. So here's the, the D to this parts that we talked about. Uh, okay. So this answer was on the right track, but like I said, it, it could have been somewhat better. All right. Uh, okay, so it's good that you had the time to, uh, to do those problems. Uh, a lot of those you got right, uh, and hopefully you were taking some notes on the, the uh, answers that uh, I mentioned uh, seemed like they could have been improved. All right, so... How many levels? What are the how? What are what are the four types of uh, protein structure? Four levels of structure. Primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. That's right. What what does primary structure mean? It's um, <clears throat> amino acids linked by covalent bonds. Good. So it's just the sequence of amino acids. It's just the sequence of amino acids. What do you call the bonds that link the amino acids? Covalent bonds. There's a particular type for those covalent bonds, though. What do we call them? Peptide. Peptide bonds, yes. Uh, and then what are the two types of secondary structure? Alpha, helix, and beta, beta sheet. Good. Um, and uh, what maintains secondary structure? The hydrogen bonds between the main chain molecules. Good. So the next level is tertiary structure. Um, so tertiary structure, it's kind of hard to put into words, but it's just a higher level of structure than secondary. The tertiary structure refers to the overall structure of one entire peptide strand. So we can put this in your notes. It's the overall structure of one entire peptide strand. And let's put this in your notes too. Tertiary structure stabilized by Weak interactions between side chains and by disulfide links. You can tell me when you have that down. Okay. Disulfide links are between side chains by definition. What do I mean by weak interactions? What are the weak interactions? Hydrogen bonds, Van der Waals forces, and electro, um, electrostatic interaction. So I was just too lazy to write all three of them, so I just summarized them as weak interactions. Okay, so that's what we mean by uh, the uh, tertiary structure. So going back to this picture here that shows the various levels of structure, notice here they have primary structure, which is just the sequence of amino acids. And then for secondary structure, they showed the two main types of secondary structure, an alpha helix and a beta sheet. Uh, by the way, uh, why, why is this called an alpha helix and why is this called a beta sheet? 
It's just because alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet and beta is the second letter. So when the secondary structures were first being described, uh, the alpha helix happened to be described first. So it was called alpha for first. And then this, the beta sheet was described second, after the alpha helix. So it's just called, the beta just here stands for the second thing to be described. That's all the alpha and the beta means here. Now here they have a picture of tertiary structure. Do you see how the tertiary structure is a higher level than the secondary structure? Because the tertiary structure includes multiple alpha helixes and beta sheets. For example, what type of structure is this? Alpha helix. And how about here? Beta clear sheet. Uh, these two, for example, look like they're anti-parallel because this arrow is going this way and this arrow is going this way. Looks like there's some other ones in the background, uh, perhaps. And then what type of structure is this? Alpha helix. And then notice there's other parts that don't really have a defined structure. There's plenty of parts of the structure that are, are more random, random-like. So the tertiary structure is just the overall structure of the entire strand. It's just the overall structure of the entire strand, which often includes parts that are alpha helixes and beta sheets. Uh, okay, very good. Um, one thing I wanted to mention about tertiary structure, uh, a common kind of tertiary structure is globular. Oftentimes you have a kind of globular uh, protein that's kind of like a glob or a ball. What types of amino acids would tend to go in the interior of that glob? And what type would be on the exterior? In particular, yeah, what, what type of amino acids would tend to go in the interior? Glycine. Why? Because it's small and it will fit well. Okay, that's not a bad answer. That's not a bad answer. That's not really what I was going for here because the, the glob doesn't, isn't necessarily packed in the center. It might have room. Um, so being small is not necessarily the key to being in the center of the glob. I think you might have been thinking about the collagen triple helix. The collagen triple helix, you really do need to have very little room between the various strands in the helix. I was going for something else here. Um, so the center of the, the, the glob, is the center of the glob going to be close to the water? Close to water? or Well, what's the fluid that surrounds the protein? What's the main fluid that surrounds the protein? in the body. Water. That's right. Water. Now, are the proteins in the center of the glob going to be close to water or far from water? Close, close to water. In, in, in the center of the protein? Yeah, in the interior. Far, far from water. So which types of uh, amino acids would tend to go there, hydrophobic or hydrophilic? Hydrophobic. Yes. So one common pattern in tertiary structure is that Nonpolar hydrophobic residues <clears throat> tend to uh, What's the word? They tend to be in the interior. And the main reason for that is what we called last time or previously the hydrophobic effect. Remember we said that hydrophobic molecules tend to clump up and try to get away from the water, reduce their surface with water. They also will have attractions between each other with van der Waals forces, but those are relatively weak. So the main thing is that it's not so much that the hydrophobic elements attract each other, but they're pushed away from the water. So that's one key fact about tertiary structure. You can tell me when you have that down. I have. So what types of residues will tend to be on, in the interior of proteins? Uh, non Nonpolar hydrophobic residues. And what type on the exterior? Um, polar hydrophilic residues. Polar and charged. Yeah. So give me an example of an amino acid that's likely to be in the interior. 
Um, <clears throat> I mean, as of that's likely to be in the interior would probably be um, something like glycine, I guess. And now, the problem with glycine is glycine almost has no side chain at all. Remember, the whole reason this is happening is because you don't want water. Water doesn't want to have to border on the side chain. But water doesn't really matter. Water actually, it's actually a little bit of a misnomer to call glycine hydrophobic. Uh, it's nonpolar, but it, it's got such a small side chain that the water doesn't much mind being close to it because it, it's only going to share a, sh a small border e anyway. I don't think I've quite explained that clearly before. I, I didn't quite explain that. So this is most important for, uh, this is most important. So actually, I should say th th this tends to be the case for um, amino acids with relatively larger hydrophobic side chains. So glycine would not be a great example of that. Alanine might be an example, although that side chain is still a little bit small. So what's another side chain that, a, a larger side chain that's hydrophobic than glycine or alanine? Phen uh, phenylalanine. That's a great example. Yeah. Another example? Uh, proline. That's a great example. Uh, give me a third example. Um, <clears throat> they don't have to be huge, just bigger than alanine and glycine. Asparagine. And why do you say asparagine? Uh, well, that's actually polar because it has a double bond of oxygen. Um, I would say methionine. Yeah, that has a sulfur, but we saw it's still fairly nonpolar. Uh, that's right. How about, say, leucine? Would leucine tend to go in the exterior or interior? Interior. Yeah, so leucine is already a, a fairly large... Uh, side chain. How about valine? Um, <coughs> yes. Interior, exterior. Interior. Okay, so that's important for the test. You need to be able to come up with examples of types of amino acids from your from your head. You might need that for a short answer type essay. So basically, um, th this applies to pretty much any nonpolar hydrophobic residue that's say bigger than alanine. Uh, glycine and alanine are so small that water probably wouldn't mind being too close to them. But anything that's bigger than, say, alanine, this is going to be a fairly large effect. So pretty much all the other nonpolar hydrophobic residues. Glycine and alanine are probably not the best examples of this because their side chains are so small. But anything bigger than that. Uh, okay. Um, where would, say, uh, aspartate tend to go? On the exterior or the interior? Aspartate would go on the exterior because it has a double bond and oxygen is polar. Um, so which... Which class is aspartate in? Nonpolar, polar, positively charged, or negatively charged? Negatively charged. So that would have been a better answer. It really likes to be on the exterior because it's not just polar, it's negatively charged. Um, where would glutamate tend to go? Glutamate um, <coughs> will go on the outside because it's, it's negatively charged. Good. Um, where would lysine tend to go? Lysine would go on the outside because it's positively charged. Where would serine tend to go? Serine uh, would go on the outside because it's polar. Okay. Those are things that are likely to come up on the test. All right. Very good. Uh, so those are some good examples. Now, these are just rules of thumb. They're not 100% true. We're not saying it's impossible to have something hydrophobic on the exterior. It's not impossible to have something polar or charged on the interior. These are just trends. These are just trends or, or patterns, not hard and fast rules. So this is an important uh, part of tertiary structure. Um, so what did we say stabilizes tertiary structure? Um by weak interactions on the side chains and disulfide links. Good. Uh, and what are the types of weak interaction? The types of weak interactions are hydrogen bonds, van der Waal forces, and electrostatic um, interactions. Right. And we said that that would be between side chains for tertiary structure. Give me an example of two residues that could have an electrostatic interaction. <clears throat> Two residues that can have an electrostatic interaction um, could be between alanine and valine.
like this. Yes. What's the definition of an electrostatic interaction? It's a temporary um, delta positive or delta negative. I, I think you're getting that confused with Van der Waals forces. Oh, oh. Um, electrostatic interactions are between between a, is it a pot? I think that would confuse with the hydrogen bonds. Hold on. I don't remember off the top of my head right now. I'll give you a clue. Another name of electrostatic interactions is ionic interactions. Does that help at all? Oh, it's. Um, the attraction between the pos oh, a positively charged atom and a negatively charged atom. Okay, that's very important. That's very important for the upcoming test, so it's important to keep reviewing that. All this stuff, there's a lot of memorization in this course, and that memorization, you have to keep going over it continually to make sure that you're, you're comfortable with it, because we need to build on this. This is stuff that has to be easy for us. Uh, what's the definition of a hydrogen bond? Hydrogen bond is uh, a weak interaction, or a weak attraction between a delta positive hydrogen and a delta negative atom. And what's the definition of Van der Waals forces? Van der, Waal, Van der Waals forces is a temporary attraction between um, a delta positive hydrogen and a, or it's a temporary attraction between a temporary delta positive hydrogen, or when a hydrogen gains a temporary delta positive or delta negative charge. It's on the right track. Uh, the problem with what you said is Van der Waals interactions don't have to involve hydrogens. Maybe the examples we've done have involved hydrogens. There's no rule that says they have to involve hydrogens. For example, it could be just between carbons. In fact, usually for Van der Waals interactions, we don't usually try to identify the exact atoms that are involved. For Van der Waals interactions, we don't usually try to identify the exact atoms that are involved. Because remember, Van der Waals interactions are usually only important if there's a bunch of overlapping van der Waals interactions over a whole stretch of a molecule. But anyway, there are attractions between temporary delta positive and delta negative charge. Remember, those temporary delta charges are created because the electrons are always just randomly moving around at random. If the electrons are moving around at random, then there would be, just by random chance, temporary delta positive and delta negative charges being formed. Okay, uh, so it looks like we were a little unclear about these. These are really crucial ideas for the course, so you can tell me when you have these down again. Okay, and maybe for completeness, we can also say the strong interaction is a covalent bond. I don't know if we ever quite defined what a covalent bond is. Covalent bond, if you remember from chemistry, is a pair of electrons shared between two atoms.
remember that covalent bonds are drawn as dashes in structures, and weak interactions are drawn as dots. Weak interactions are drawn as dots, covalent bonds are drawn as dashes. Okay, all right, so uh, that's important to review. In any case, um, what I was going over uh, again is uh, we know tertiary structure is partly maintained by electrostatic interactions, so I was gonna ask you, what would be an example of two residues that could have an electrostatic interaction? Um, <clears throat> lysine and aspartate. Good. Why those? Because lysine has a positive charge and aspartate has a negative charge on it. Excellent. What would be an example of two residues that could stabilize tertiary structure with hydrogen bonding? Um, tyrosine and serine. Okay, that's good. Because they have delta positive hydrogens and delta negative atoms. Good. What would be an example of two side chains that could participate in van der Waals interactions? Um, any? What? Yeah, pretty much any could have, but what would be two side chains where van der Waals interactions would be important? Between, um, I'd say alanine and Isoleucine. Good. Alanine might not be the best choice again, though, because its side chain is so small, there's not many points of overlap with other side chains. Remember, again, van der Waals interactions are weak, so they're generally only significant if there's a bunch of points of overlap. So let's use some slightly larger, uh, what would be another side chain larger than alanine? Leucine. So maybe leucine and isoleucine could have some good van der Waals interactions between them. Okay. Okay, well, th there's other things that we might say here about tertiary structure, but we wanted to move on to the next chapter. So we'll leave it at that uh, for the time being. Uh, so uh, let's just try to finish off this chapter briefly with the last level of structure, which is quaternary structure. Uh, you tell me, do you remember from class or from the textbook, what does quaternary structure refer to? Isn't it um, four groups of globular tertiary structures? Okay. A group of four parts of a tertiary structure made into one. Okay. There's, there's elements there that are correct, but that, that's also not quite right. First of all, uh, so basically quaternary structure is, quaternary structure exists when a peptide when a protein consists of more than one peptide strand. Let's put this in our notes. Quaternary structure exists when a protein consists of more than one peptide strand. Remember that tertiary structure was the structure of one peptide strand. Now, many proteins only have one strand. Many proteins only have one strand. But if a protein has more than one strand, then uh, it would have a quaternary structure. Okay. Uh, do you have that down? Yes. Let's see if we're understanding that. Do all proteins have primary structure? Yes. Yeah. Do all proteins have secondary structure? Uh, well, actually, I'm not sure the answer to that myself. All right, forget that. Probably, so, probably not all, I don't know that all proteins have secondary structure. Maybe small ones don't. I don't know they all have alpha helixes and beta pleaches. So let's forget that. But um, do all proteins have tertiary structure? Yes. That's right. Do all proteins have quaternary structure? No. No. Probably most don't. Probably most proteins don't have quaternary structure. Which proteins have quaternary structure? Um, ones that exist when a protein or one, one has more than one peptide strand. That's right. So many, probably most proteins, most proteins only consist of one strand. Most proteins only have one strand, so their structure ends at tertiary structure. But probably a minority of proteins have more than one strand. 
uh, that are interacting with each other, and those are the ones with quaternary structure. Now, there was some, uh, that, that was close to what you were saying, but there was a couple mistakes in what you said. One thing is, I think you were focusing on globular proteins, but quaternary structure doesn't necessarily refer to a globular uh, type protein. Uh, it could be, say, a fibrous protein or, or some other type of structure. Uh, the other thing is, you said that there had to be, it sounded like you were saying there had to be four strands, but that's a mistake. That's kind of like a pun. This is not called quaternary structure because there's four strands. I know that quat means four, but it's not called quaternary structure because there's four strands. Remember, all we need is two or more. W why is it called quat? What does the four refer to here? It just means it's the fourth thing after tertiary, right? It's, only, it's not called quaternary because there's four strands. It's just called quaternary because the previous term that we defined was tertiary. Uh, it's kind of like beta, the, the, beta, the beta sheets are just called beta because they come second after alpha. Uh, quaternary structure doesn't have four things in it. It's just the fourth structure that's described after the third one, which is tertiary. Okay. Uh, so uh, how many strands does a quaternary structure have? More than one. Yeah, two or more. It doesn't have to have four. Let's put this in your notes as well. Quaternary structure is stabilized by the same interactions as tertiary structure. Quaternary structure is stabilized by the same interactions as tertiary structure. So what, what is that? What is quaternary structure stabilized by? Tertiary structures? Uh, no, no, that, that's a misunderstanding. That, that, that doesn't make any sense, does it? It doesn't make sense to say quaternary yeah. structure is stabilized by tertiary structure. What I was saying was... The, the forces that stabilize tertiary structure are the same as the forces that stabilize quaternary structure. So I, I was hoping if you remember what stabilizes tertiary structure, that will tell us what stabilizes quaternary structure. So what, what, is it, what, what did we say earlier today are the interactions that stabilize tertiary structure? Uh, the weak interactions on the side chains and the disulfide links. So what stabilizes quaternary structure? Weak interactions like um, hydrogen bonding, van der Waals forces, and electrostatic uh, interactions. Yeah, so basically the same thing as the tertiary structures. Weak interactions between side chains and disulfide links. So what we have here is the same thing that we had here for tertiary structure. Okay, tell me when you have that down. So what stabilizes quaternary structure? Weak interactions between side chains and disulfide links. What stabilizes tertiary structure? Weak interactions between side chains and disulfide links. What uh, stabilizes secondary structure? Um, hydrogen bonding between the main chain atom. That's right. Uh, and primary structure depends on the covalent bonds, especially the peptide bonds. Okay. So here is a picture here again. Why is this called quaternary structure? Uh, not, not spelled very well here, but uh, why is this called quaternary structure? Because it, there are uh, more than one peptide strands on there. Yeah, how many strands do you see here? Um, In this box? Two. Yeah, that's what I see. Two. So does quaternary structure have to have four strands? No. no. Uh, so the quaternary structure, and uh, they didn't show it, but what do you think is holding this strand close to this strand? I, um, the weak interactions and disulfide bonds? Yeah, something like that. Some types of weak interactions or disulfide linkages must be holding these in their vicinity uh, of each other. Um, so anyway, this page here summarizes, hopefully this gives you an intuitive idea of the different levels of structure. Primary structure is just the sequence of amino acids. Secondary structure are regular repeating patterns 
like the alpha helix and the beta sheet. Tertiary structure is the entire overall structure of one complete strand. And remember, many proteins stop with tertiary structure, uh, but some proteins then go on to quaternary structure, which is two or more strands interacting with each other. By the way, do you see why the primary structure was written here in two rows? Why are there two rows? Well, presumably, maybe this is the primary structure of one of the strands, and this is the primary structure of the other. Uh, presumably, this is only part. Uh, that, that these, these would have way more than just this number of amino acids, but these are parts of the uh, structures of these two different strands, uh, perhaps. Uh, okay. Here's another picture that shows how the different structures come together. Here's primary structure, which is just the amino acid sequence. Secondary structure is alpha helixes and beta sheets. Tertiary structure is the entire three-dimensional structure of one peptide. And then quaternary structure here is when you have more than one strand. How many strands do you think you have here? Four. Right. By the way, um, I want to move on to the next chapter, so I won't go into this in detail, but do you happen to know what's the most famous protein that has quaternary structure? Hemoglobin. That's right. In fact, it looks like that's what they have a picture of here. So hemoglobin you'll probably be studying in more detail later in your course. Uh, but it's pretty famous that hemoglobin is uh, a structure that has quaternary structure. It, in fact, does have four strands in its quaternary structure. Okay. Okay, well, there's some other topics that uh, could be on the test uh, that uh, in Chapter 4, uh, but there's also lots of topics in Chapter 5. So let's move on to Chapter 5.